I was like, we've no costumes. And you were like, I was, I think I said to you, I have a gorilla costume. Went home, tried it on. It was too small for me. So you're like, I'll take that. Grand. I was like, okay, what am I going to wear? And you were uh, putting two and two together. So we're like, uh, I have the costume for you. So we called your mother's house and you went up and you got your mother's wedding dress, I believe. And we went up. <laughs> whoa, whoa, whoa. Which if you're going to say you fitted it into my mother's <laughs> wedding dress. <laughs> Joe presents Baz and Andrew's House of Rugby, together with Guinness. Hello, and you're very welcome to Baz and Andrew's House of Rugby here on Joe, together with Guinness. We have a great show for you lined up today. Over the last few months, we've had some really great guests on the show, to be fair. We've had Victor Matfield, John de Villiers, uh, Conan O'Donnell from New Zealand, Drew Mitchell in Australia, Simon Zebo and Finn Russell from Paris, Ian McKinley and Michael Bradley from Italy, Simon O'Keefe from New York, Jesus, we've been all over the place, Mike Brown in England and James Hook in Wales. Well, Jesus, international or what? Uh, but this week we're going closer to home because our next guest is about uh, literally 120 metres from me right now, uh, marinating across the road, David Kilcoyne. Uh, is very excited to come on the show um so we can't wait for that in a few minutes yeah we have also got our our favorite penguin we we don't like to differentiate between uh, our penguins we love them all the same mm. but we like sam brown the best mm. um, i think it's because you're more familiar like you might be more you might like more your your older child a bit more than your youngest because you you're more familiar with them right Potentially, but there's also a bit of a novelty with the new one as well. <laughs> you get a bit fed up with the older one. Okay, so maybe after this one, we'll get fed up with Sam. Maybe, maybe. Um, that's the way to keep our penguins on their toes. <laughs> so explain who, explain who Sam was again. So Sam, um, we I, I felt like uh, we, we really hit it off with Sam. We did, um, we reviewed Leon the week when Sam was on. Uh, and we were talking like we were an authority on movies. <laughs> and then afterwards, um, Sam revealed to us that he's a documentary uh, filmmaker, <laughs> and <laughs> which was embarrassing from our point of view. Uh, so we might get him to review our, our last few weeks reviews, which would be mm-hmm. interesting to hear um, if, if there's anything credible in anything that we've said. And also he'd be able to tell us a little bit because we're coming out of that lockdown stage now where the end is in sight you might only get another couple of weeks like binging on TV and, and kind of just yeah. drinking it in and doing, doing what you do best. Barry, someone uh, drew my attention to that at the weekend, actually. Uh, Barry was like, you know what? It's so reassuring to have someone when we're going into lockdown. Barry was like, I've got this. Hold my beer. <laughs> 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 so, uh, so a couple more weeks, we'll just get a bit of direction from Sam. On yeah. He's also, his, his wife is due uh, a baby this week. So, I texted him last night to request maybe a home birth live on the show to <laughs> speed it up. So stay tuned, folks. <laughs> could be a first. It's an exclusive. Yeah. He said he'd see what he could do anyway. Um, deadly stuff. Sure, we'll get we'll get Sam on later on. We'll get Killer on in a few minutes. Uh, but uh, obviously, each week our show is going out on YouTube, and we now have over 800 subscribers. Thank you very much for that. So keep those coming and keep spreading the word, Penguins. Um, but finally, we have some rugby to talk about. Finally, New Zealand as a country have nailed the handling of uh, the COVID-19 crisis. And on Saturday, they declared that they had gone 22 days without any confirmed cases. And then to celebrate that, they had a stadium packed to the rafters for the first of the Super Rugby uh, Ea Torora Ea. <laughs> uh, game. I, I think it's hard to say that <clears throat> without going full Mari. Ea <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well. and, and it's another one of those words. Like, So obviously we both mispronounced that again, but we're getting a lot more familiar with it. Um, and... Any other podcast would have presented themselves as experts in uh, Aotearoa or whatever you call it, <laughs> but not us. We're zero, honest. Zero effort gone into it. <laughs> it has too many vowels. That's the first, I just can't comprehend something with that many uh, any vowels in it. Well, that's the thing with the Maori language. There's too many vowels. <laughs> <laughs> if you ask me, <laughs> Welsh have too many consonants. The, the, the feckin' Maoris have too many vowels. Uh, 
But apart from that, it was absolutely spectacular. I was glued to it. Uh, Highlanders versus the Chiefs. And then uh, it, that was in Dunedin. And then the Blues versus the Hurricanes in Auckland. My goodness, it was a fine example of live sport and live watching of sport because, I don't know, there was it was ecstatic. The speeches at the start, the crack. Everyone was there, obviously, to watch sport, but it was a social gathering of just pure crack banter and entertainment and uh, although it was eight o'clock in the morning here I was lepping around the sitting room um, and yeah what an advertisement for New Zealand have you seen that a lot of Americans apparently are watching what's going on over there and how well they've handled everything and they're now starting to try and buy tons of property and getting you know basically moved to New Zealand I don't know how <laughs> <Is> that... <laughs> mental <clears throat> Is Imagine. that right? Is that actually what, it, is that what they're doing? Yeah, they're like going, Jesus, look at this place. Imagine being a, a Kiwi, you'd be like, oh, Jesus. No. You, no. Sh- oh, no sh- shut up. <laughs> you know, like, in fairness, they, they have done an unbelievable job. And what's the Jadina Erde and the, the Prime Minister, like, she's obviously... The best too many minister. vials, too many vials, yeah, too many vials, which is the best <laughs> prime minister in the world. And uh, as well a job as she's doing, if I was a key, I'd be like, Shut up a little bit, will you? Yes, yes, oh, say nothing, tone it down. We don't want like millions of yanks moving, up, moving over here. It's chaos over there. We're having great crack here. We're all just happy out, doing a little bit of surfing, uh, doing our dances, and playing a little bit of rugby. We're having the crack and we're sound. I don't know. I, I, the other side of this is that um, they're kind of asking for it a little bit. That's so yeah, that's yeah. Some of them are because I I was torn watching it and I was thinking this is this is a, an amazing occasion. Obviously, with all what's going on over the last couple of months, uh, and these guys have done it right and they're getting what they deserve. But I thought they were a little smug, mm. just a little bit. We're back playing rugby. What are you guys doing? I was thinking, <laughs> still like- watching Netflix, are you? <laughs> It's like if, you, if you're ever in primary school and your teacher is probably too hungover to do uh, to do any work with you and gives you a little a bit of classwork to do and it's simple and you're like fucking simple uh, and you just kind of get through it for the first two minutes then you can just color you can just draw or something for the next <laughs> half an hour and some gold bag in your class goes finished and then <laughs> teacher's like oh really and you're like shut up will you shut up or or if here's more closer if you're on a stag party right and on the second day of a stag party you know that day and like you're getting into the swing of it but there's some crew of the stag who've gone very hard that morning they've gone started early gone out getting loose by 10 or 11 o'clock in the morning and then by four o'clock they're absolute potholes and they're 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 trying to you know you know you're not going to get in anywhere so you get a little splinter group, four or five, and you go off and you find this corner pub just right down the bottom of the world. And you just have lovely crack there. And you like, this is it. like the fire is in the corner. And this, you know, there's a match on the television. You're all watching the match. It's like, yes. And there's creamy points, a few nice birds in the corner. You're kind of chatting up. And then one of you sends a picture of what you're doing to the WhatsApp group at around six o'clock. And then everyone from the stag comes piling in. (laughs) Ruined. Fucking bananas. Knocking over tables. uh, Just wrecking the place. Gets you kicked out. And and it's all ruined. That's uh, the first half of that. The first half of that is what happened on uh, Chris Henry's stag. Um, It was uh, Munich. And it was like one of the, what do you call that? Like festival over there. Um, uh, Everybody. What? What is it? Oktoberfest. Yeah, yeah. So everybody's going mental at that. And then we were there for the first while. And then myself and because uh, I've got no stamina <clears throat> to do that for a while. And then I, I'm a wee bit tired <laughs> go for a lie down. <clears throat> so uh, and but fortunately for me, Robbie Diak and Rob Herring were both on the exact same page. So we just took ourselves off. We went and got a coffee. We uh, we went on TripAdvisor and found like the most um, uh, the like the number one tourist attraction in Munich and there was a like a static wave on a river 
and, and like a bridge overlooking it. So all these guys surfing. We had a lovely morning. It was lovely. And then you're, like, Aust- and, you're Australia, man. You're Australia. Well, you're not even New Zealand. Yeah, I know. I know. You're on a I different know. stag. To be fair, I'm probably the, the lads who go too hard in the morning. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and ruin it for everyone. Yeah. I was uh, I, I was at a, a Zoom stag on Friday night. What? <laughs> yes, I know. <clears throat> It was as good as a Zoom stag could be. It's uh, Anna's brother's um, wedding. Obviously, got like postponed there a couple of months ago because of everything. And then, uh, yeah, so they they get married in a couple of weeks' time, uh, and they, we just had to we just had to make do. <laughs> just everybody went around telling stories, and then like, okay, folks, see you, see you all at the wedding. <laughs> Close your laptops. <laughs> it was was it, was it that awkward moment of trying to leave the the Zoom call when, when yes. Everyone- Trying to find your window when everyone's talking, and you're like, "Yeah," and some fella won't stop talking. You're like, Jesus Christ. I I'm, just like, text it, text, them. text it into the Zoom chat. I'm away here, fellas. <laughs> uh, yeah. But look, let's talk quickly about rugby just to get it out of out of my system. So first of all, first of all, though, the the occasion it was a lovely occasion. It mm. looked like everybody was buzzing. Just that we kind of little bit smog, little bit we we're playing rugby, and then it just felt like the most timeless um, persona ever. The, everybody on this occasion, all the supporters, all the TV guys, are all having this amazing time. Carnival atmosphere, uh, celebrations. No one even really cares about the result. They're just loving watching live sport and watching rugby. And then the re- the referees just said. Oh, you're all having a good time, are you? <laughs> you're all offside. We're in charge. <laughs> they, they tried to ruin the buzz. They did. They got a bit whistle happy for, for both games, to be fair. Um, yeah. <clears throat> although I, I wasn't too bothered because it look, they had made some law changes and they needed to stamp down early. And it was offsides and it was entry at the rock that they were that they were stamping down on. And that made the defenses less in your face and it made the rocks a little bit more. No one was really taking the pace of the rocks. So it was just like fast ball. Um, and they didn't use the VM or what's it called? The, the TMO. The VPL. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't use the TMO at all. It, maybe, did they? I don't remember. Oh, no, they didn't because um, there, there was the one try by Leonard Brown, was it? I can't remember. And, Leonard uh, Brown passed and- it. Yeah, oh, no, yeah. Sorry, yeah, it was Dan McKenzie passed it to him. Yeah, yes, and they, and that was the one when um the the ref goes, Are "You happy?" and he goes, um, "Yeah." I mean, like, it was so <laughs> he just got caught up in the moment because it probably was okay, but it was definitely worth look, having a look at. And then mm-hmm. the ref said to Aaron uh, Aaron Smith, oh, "I've got three hippies, happy, happy, happy." Try even Leonard Brown when he was putting the ball down was like, <laughs> "Yes, I'm yeah. um, surely that wasn't the wasn't the try, but." Ah, uh, look, I'm as you said. It, I don't know. The Super Rugby always has that vibe to it that it's not too much about who wins the game. It's more about how good this game can be. Um, and watching these two games the weekend, do you reckon there's much we can learn about learn from their presentation of rugby and how it's played? I know this is a conversation that's been going on for years, but I suppose it's more highlighted now when we've had a break and you see how well they do it, especially when it's just New Zealand teams and how entertaining and cool and the amount of young people at these games, like teenagers on the pace, having the crack and, uh, you know, a bit of a party atmosphere. Um, whereas, I don't know, here, provincial games, there seems to be a lack of that kind of buzz. Would that be fair enough? Yeah, I know, I know you're probably going to suggest that it could be something like the rearranging the season to make it more of a summer vibe, more of a... Yeah. Everybody out enjoying themselves, having a better... Everybody's always in better form in the summer. Why don't we just play... Play rugby in the summer that's kind of where you're going is it that is my first option but outside of that then i suppose it's making the big games as big as possible so like this argument has been going on for a while about leinster versus Munster, especially at christmas when um the teams are picked uh when most of their teams are having arrests and we don't get to see the best players in the in the country play and even the time of year they're played sometimes doesn't lend itself to a very fast exciting game of rugby um so why not put them in a time of year when there's going to be all the players available and it's more of a you know if there's a little bit more sunshine uh and get the crowds out enjoying dry rugby with a bit of an atmosphere party season yeah um, yeah. yeah there's something there but i think uh, i think our tendency is always to say uh, what are they doing that we could be doing better 
Um, and there was an element of, of the weekend, especially the, the game, the Blues game. They sold out Eden Park. Like they haven't sold out Eden Park for a Blues game since 2003, apparently. Mm. <laughs> and and there was there was something noticeably different about that, that Super Rugby game. It was so much more compelling. Obviously, the, the occasion added massively to it. But there was almost like a European Cup level of intensity, mm. which added as well. So... <clears throat> As much as we're saying, um, what can we learn from them? It's accident, not accidentally, but just coincidentally, they've got a massive crowd. Everybody's like really excited, really buzzing, and there's a level of intensity at that game. And then add to that, then the, you know higher standard really than there is in Europe. But the intensity added to it, I thought, and that's a European thing though. That's mm. an Irish thing, actually, especially yeah. an Irish thing really in European rugby. Fair enough. Yeah, you're you're right. It it is uh, the occasion, the fact that it hasn't been there hasn't been a game in the world for three months definitely lend itself to the crowd and the atmosphere. Um, so a little bit about yeah, we have the intensity here. Uh, I suppose it's the getting the right uh, games that we can highlight how good it is over here, especially the provincial games. And look, we'll see them in in August when the. Uh, when those games kick off in the Aviva, obviously they'll be behind closed doors, but it'll be great to see all the best players in Ireland going head to head. Um, but the rugby, some of the rugby at the weekend, as you said, probably the Blues and the Hurricanes, my favourite. Um, and just even this, having all those players in the pitch, like Barrett, Pernara, Coles, uh, Ione, and then the sideline, Umanga, Carter, uh-huh. uh, Carlos Spencer, McDonald, all these superstars that are just like, carrying water bottles and stuff it just oh, massively lended itself to the occasion um outstanding player rike ione <laughs> too many vials um now hot take on this i said this before the world cup i think new zealand struggled in the world cup because they haven't replaced conrad smith and um uh, <clears throat> nanu ma nanu uh, since they both left new zealand rugby they haven't really gotten the 12, 13 that have, I don't know, been as massive a threat. Sonny Bill obviously has his moments, as does Goodhue, um, and as does, who else in the centre for them, Leonard Brown uh, or Crotty. But in the World Cup, they didn't really stand out, didn't really shine. And if I was going up against them personally, I'd be like, yeah, I can, I could manage all of them. If I was playing, I would, I would be confident that any Irish 13 could manage them. Whereas starting Rico... Ioni in 13 was he was lethal and it's like ah this is the game changer for New Zealand um, yeah but he, he's been lethal he probably took a bit of a dip maybe after the Lions did he but um, he's been pretty lethal on the wing the whole time as well mm. um, it's just having someone in 13 that can create space for, for everyone out wide which they've, they've been lacking and it's not usually you could stick a, ter- and a winger in 13 and uh, he'll get that but yeah. His, in, his in and away and his ability to fix defenders at the weekend, get his hands free and, and offload was spectacular. And he's just so quick, man. Yeah. Yeah, he looks powerful, doesn't he? Just when he takes off. Mm. Um, yeah, yeah. He's uh, New, Zealand, <laughs> New Zealand, I think they can do what they want. Like, I know what you're saying about um, not replacing those guys in the centre, but there's, there's plenty of talent there as well. Um, uh, New, New Zealand can do what they want, I'd say, and they'll they'll be grand. They'll replace those guys, no problem. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, Mackenzie, I thought was 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 very good uh, for the Chiefs. He's one he's one that gets the crowd behind him because he's he's the he's this he's the little guy, and I think the little guy always gets a little bit more support. It's nice to see a little guy, you know, Shane Williams, or um, and he was he was pretty pretty class the weekend as well, wasn't he? Oh, brilliant, man. He hasn't played in a long time either, but yeah, like created two tries, got a drop goal, um, and you thought he kind of had it until Bryn um, Gatland. <laughs> oh, what a perfect way to finish that game. Like, mm. he couldn't have asked for more entertainment uh, when the coach... He bent it. He bent the, like, the drop goal. Like, so he almost like read the way the, the guy was coming to charge it down. Yeah. And he reshaped yeah. it to bend it around him. Yeah. God, I was so yeah. shy to drop goals. I'm just so impressed when anyone can do that. Did you ever take one? I took one of my first ever under 21 international against Scotland and I hit the corner flag. That was the oh. only ever time I took one. Um, so, did you? Never once. 
Not surprised for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, any other rugby news? Uh, talking Ireland players taking a 20% cut in pay. Uh, obviously, that's been since the kind of mid-COVID uh, disaster. <clears throat> but the statement for the Irish Rugby Players uh, Association is that we're very disappointed to see recent media reports about proposed player salary cuts. A very early phase of discussions with the RFU to establish fully the current and long-term financial position of the union. And only then can the players fully consider uh, any proposal. Rugby Players Ireland will not be commenting further uh, at this time. It's so, a little bit of a shame that, um, by contrast, all the positive stuff coming out of New Zealand and then there's you know, an argument over pay in Ireland. It's a little bit of a shame. It is, yeah. Uh, I don't know if the RFU have responded to that anyway but um yeah it is look there's hopefully we'll have more more positive news when everyone gets back to training because that's starting next week right uh players are back start focusing on the games and as you said yeah just get us back to normal <coughs> um and uh, finally i think rugby news fla our our very own jerry flannery signing for harlequins as the line out specialist coach uh, for next season, which is an unbelievable move for Flat, move for Flat. I'm delighted with him, or for him. Sorry. Uh, yeah, what do you think? Yeah, we we did what we could to to tarnish his um, you know, his his uh, his, his knowledgeable rugby brand, <laughs> but he still maintained enough knowledge to yeah. get himself a job in rugby. Yeah, uh, I, love, I love when all this started in March, and he was like, I'm going to take a little a little break for a while. Obviously, he was he started negotiating then or started his chat then, so uh, he couldn't tell us. And even when we'd Mike Brown on, remember Mike Brown was kind of sniffing around afterwards when we were when we were on the off the phone with him, and he was like, "Oh, what's Flannery up to?" I was like, "Ah, ah. <laughs> all adding up." But yeah, great move for him. Um, he'll be missed, obviously, but we must get him on the call once the season starts over there. See how they're going. Uh, but right, we'll be back in part two with David Kilcoyne. As I said, marinating across the road. I can smell him from here. <laughs> All right, welcome to the show, David Kilcoyne. Killer, how are you? How has lockdown been treating you? Thanks for having me, Baz. Yeah, I'm great. Um, obviously, it's been an incredibly strange time, tough time for a lot of people. Um, but look, we've adjusted, I think, as everyone has had to, and you know, just make the best of a bad situation. So, what have you been doing to make the best of it? I suppose probably the same as most people else, glued to things like Save the Last Dance. Uh, you know, listen to a couple Save of podcasts. Save the Last Dance. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just doing reading books, chilling out in the house, doing a lot of training here in the house. Um, now with the restrictions lifted, it's been a lot better. Like you know, we're myself jj hanrahan and rona mahoney we're all living in evanwood so we had a little training group here and now we're able to train down in bows and into castle troy park which has been great yeah i've um i i've never gotten a more resounding uh response from people when i've asked them for a little bit of uh crack on on a player <laughs> your teammates came back with yeah, just too just much an abundance of crack yeah <laughs> Actually, JJ said to me that he wanted me to ask you about those weight sessions that you've been doing at home. He said you've been doing two weight sessions a day and been bragging about it, whereas, in fact, you've just been splitting the one weight session into <laughs> two 13-minute weight sessions. <laughs> Look, you've got to take what JJ says with a pinch of salt. He's losing his mind as long as he's along with the hair, like so. Uh, Ooh, no, Look... We have a, a good little training group here now with JJ, me and Ronan, which has been very good. Um, so do you do it out in the green? We do it out the back. We actually, we bought stuff from Elbury's and in fairness to Munster, they were very good to us. They gave us a good bit of equipment. So between the two of us, we pretty much have a full full gym to do the two 13-minute sessions a day out there. Uh, do you get wow. fired up, Killer? Is it, uh, is it competitive with no, I com- no, com- no output at the weekend to play? Is it competitive with the boys? It actually, I'll tell you what, Primby, uh, Ronan O'Mahony, who retired uh, la- or two years ago now with his ankle, um, he's got mad into the CrossFit. You've done a couple of sessions with him, Baz, and he's been yeah, kind of... Yeah, a freak. Yeah, he's like, he's turned into an absolute monster. He's probably in better shape now than he's ever been. Um, and he's been doing a couple of sessions with us, Joe, trying to keep <clears> it, <throat> uh, mix it up with a couple of the CrossFit things. And uh, from that point of view, it has been competitive. So it is a, it's something 
Um, you know, you don't have the game at the weekend, so you need something. So Ron Mahoney is our, our go-to now at the moment. Yeah, and you're back to training next Monday. So how are you feeling going into it? Are you, are you feeling very fit, feeling kind of fresh, uh, feeling strong? Yeah, the body is feeling great, actually. Um, I picked up a shoulder injury against England. Um, and, you know, I suppose taking the positives out of it, you know, I've had this time to, to get it right. Um, you know, that's the way you got to look at it. Obviously, you want to be playing every week. But, uh, you know, I got an injection in my shoulder. Uh, I wasn't able to do it initially over the whole COVID thing. They weren't taking appointments in the, in the regional. But when things started to free up a bit, uh, I was able to get that and settle it down. So, yeah, body's raring to go and can't wait to meet all the lads on Monday and get back into it. And do you know what your plan is for the week? Is it uh, is it back to pre-season training, kind of as you know, as disgusting as I remember it? Is it that kind of stuff? Yeah, I presume it's going to be day one Bronco test, and we go from there. I was telling you about that yesterday. Yeah, so nothing much has changed. You know, it's, I think four weeks on, one week off. Ho- hopefully, three weeks on, and then again at the end of the at the end of that. So. Well, wow, that is an intense fucking seven weeks, isn't it? Um, so I suppose you can start with with a regular preseason then, because it is normally that long. So it's um, it's good to to kind of ease your way into. Because I, I heard a lot of people in New Zealand kind of w- wondering whether the players would have had enough contact, had enough uh, you know time, yeah, in contact basically before going into what was a pretty intense weekend. Whereas you'll have plenty of time to to work up to that. Yeah, we will. Look, we were, we're on our three weeks essentially holidays now but we were before we broke up uh we were some of the forwards and the backs uh were giving out tackle shields like the front rows were giving the low ones and stuff to do can't mimic contact as best you could at home so i'm living with uh, my housemate here ronan butler so i had him holding the pad where i'd say people were looking at us like two lunatics hitting the oak but <laughs> uh and come here the season itself that we've just uh moved on from kind of stop start for you you've never really had an injury um but um that was your first one coming out of the world cup uh so that must have been a bit frustrating but take me back to before the world cup you were probably one of the most informed players going into the to the world cup from the warm up games um the world cup itself then was that was that a frustrating uh time for you um i mean it must have been enjoyable as well but was it frustrating yeah look uh i think every rugby player and targets the World Cup, you know, it's once every four years. Uh, so it obviously, you know, you set out your goals at the start of the year, short term, medium, long term, and uh, going to the World Cup. And, uh, you know, obviously trying to win the World Cup was my goal. Uh, so going in there, I felt in, in, in great form and great nick. And, you know, you get there then. And um, obviously, I really enjoyed the tournament. Uh, I was happy, you know with my contributions I suppose but you you ultimately want to be playing um more and more um you know we didn't get the results uh didn't go our way so you know it was a very frustrating tournament um but then I suppose you get back into six nations and then it's blown up over covid so it's tough enough to keep that momentum going but um you know we're into pre seed big long pre season now and hopefully we finish off this six nations which I think is vitally important because I really think we've a great crack great chance of it Keller was there um, was there a review period or did they did they go around the players and get some feedback on a few thoughts about the way like the, um, the way the plan was put together or anything was there anything kind of identified because like if if the team don't do it internally then they just leave it to external journalists who really don't have a clue what's going on so the same thing happened in 2007 and then everybody's speculating but the guys who know um, is there, was there anything done like that after the World Cup yeah, um, hundred percent. You know, uh, I think Faz. You know, he's been there, done it all. You know, league and and union, and um, you know, he, he understands the game so well. You know, we we brought it in, we talked it out, um, long. We really talked it out, uh, and then came up with a couple of solutions and tried to to ride him for the Six Nations. And I, th- I think we were really um, starting to find our feet. You know, uh, I think we started well. You know, the England game, um wasn't our best performance but um i thought we were on an upward trajectory and uh unfortunately the covid broke and you know it, it's it stifled things um but we did a, a big internal review trimby funny how it's um 
it's always small things. It's never like the bit we got this all massively wrong. It's just I'm thinking like so World Cup 2007, and then World Cup 2011, and the the mm. the, the learnings from uh, 07 was let's keep the players more stimulated, keep them out in the boat, keep them more in the mix, and kind of having more fun, which just effectively meant. Um, change hotels more often you know and something as trivial yeah. as that ended up being a successful world cup yeah exactly but it's true you know you you, you can the world cup has become i suppose such a, a pressure pot now for ireland to perform and um and when you know you don't hit the ground running you know that pressure builds and builds and um you know it's how you probably handle that and maybe we, we didn't handle that as best we could Come here, take me back. You mentioned Bose there a few minutes ago and you're heading down to, to Anacati to train there, back where it all started. Yeah. Uh, under under said, eights, I presume. Yeah. Under eights, um, yeah. Uh, our fathers played together. I think you, my dad said you, you've... you've uh, me and your father emceed many a bus for the under 20s over the years. He was... Uh, we, we had a very successful uh, 20s team there for two years. and uh, Two All-Irelands, uh, right? To all Ireland's, yeah, and your dad was very quick to jump on the bandwagon. Uh, was. <laughs> yeah, every way, every way, Trip Mickey was in giving the, the team talk. Uh, so yeah, I know it was it was an incredible time. Yeah, your dad, my dad said you you've uh, you stole your nickname off your dad because he's um, he was renowned for being an absolute filth bag on the pitch back in the day. Um, yeah, sure. I'm still going home, and he goes ah, every every single day. It's, <laughs> I'm the real killer that that's how he introduces himself to people. I'm like, okay, that's my dad. Trimby, I love Trimby, if you know Castle Troy at all, um, I'll be down by Castle Troy shopping centre, going for, you know, just driving to the shop sometime and I'll see this fella coming towards me with a sombrero on, a pair of Bermuda, <laughs> a pair of Bermuda shorts, and an Ireland vest top that's clearly killers. And I'm like, who is this lunatic? <laughs> And it's 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 usually Pat Kilcoyne that's coming towards me, big mad hitting him. Uh, so you didn't lick it off a stamp, did you? Yeah. So my mum and dad would go for a walk every evening, and you probably you don't see my mother because she's about 20, 20 paces ahead of my father. He's back <laughs> struggling to keep up in the sombrero and the Munster school jersey from two thousand. <laughs> Yeah, oh, I love it. He's an absolute character, man. Uh, but yeah, then then you went on to, I suppose, Monster Academy. Um, and then I had the pleasure of coaching you for a year, two years, maybe. Two years, um, yeah. Before you kicked on from Monster. So what were you then? That was 2010 and 2011. So our first, well, actually, do you ever remember our first? It was under, I was with the 20s and I was calling. I think we were playing Cork Khan around... I'll give you a funny story before we get into the serious stuff. Uh, we were playing Cork Khan uh, and I got called into the senior team and we won the game and it was around Halloween and we were like, feck it, what do we do? And I don't know who came up with it anyway, said we'd go to Galway after beating Cork Khan and uh, we were break up for, we had a break for the week after it. So obviously you were dr- uh, driving the crack back then at this st- at the time. And I was like a, a young 19 year old. I was like, Oh, unbelievable. Can't wait to get involved now. So I was like, we've no costumes. And you were like, I was, I think I said to you, I have a gorilla costume. Went home, tried it on. It was too small for me. So you're like, I'll take that grand. I was like, okay, what am I going to wear? And you were, uh, putting two and two together. So we we're like, uh, I have the costume for you. So we called your mother's house. And you went up and you got your mother's wedding dress, I believe. And we went up. <laughs> whoa, whoa, whoa. If you're, gonna say you, if you're gonna say you fitted it into my mother's <laughs> wedding <Yeah>. dress. <laughs> she was obviously back in great Nick back in the day, like um, <laughs> she thinks we, you're a lovely boy killer. She's gonna hate I know, that sure. Dress. I don't know that she still know where that wedding dress was gone. I remember we were walking through Galway anyway, it's a bride and groom's villa like and uh <laughs> Every every pub we were going into, whatever the wedding dress were back in the day, the veil was about 20 metres behind me. So everyone kept standing on it as I was going up the stairs. I was like, no, I can't <laughs> fix this. So I'm behind the, I remember I went behind the bar and I got a knife and I cut it into like a mini dress. So by the end of it, myself and myself were going around in your mother's mini dress slash wedding dress and the gorilla suit. So, yeah. Well, Actually, before that, we were in a, we were in another pub, and you were thrown out of the other pub. And I think it might have been the Keys or something, a big pub in Galway. 
and I was looking across the bar and I could see you being escorted down the stairs by the bouncers and you had the front of your, the wedding dress in your hands like like a bride would and then the two bouncers were behind you holding the back of your, <laughs> <laughs> your wedding dress. I think I was shouting at them, don't, don't get that dirty. <laughs> Don't ruin my were, day. Yeah, <laughs> obediently, like, <laughs> escorting you out while, like, two bridesmaids holding your wedding dress. Oh, yeah. that was phenomenal. Yeah, I remember that very well. I don't think you were even that young, man. I think you were mid-20s back then. <laughs> I was 20s. Um, what, was, uh, what, then, was Barry, what was Barry like as a coach, Keller? Yeah, he was very good. Uh, Trimby, he was... You'd been recently out of the game, Baz, so, you know... You, I think that's the, the beauty of someone who recently comes out of the game. You know, you're very in tune with, um, you know, you knew the latest calls, the latest plays. You implemented a lot of what we were doing with Munster and with Bowes. And, um, yeah, very good. Threw a lot yeah, of I dummies think... back in his day, Barry did. I, know, I imagine I know. that would be a strong point of his coaching. Sure, um, that's all I had, yeah. I, have to, yeah. I, uh, I, was... I was at the sale game. I have the wall. Ah, there you go. Sounds like try. everyone hopped the wall back in the day. <laughs> the the wall try. Yeah. Uh, well, come here. I think Declan Kidney, when I went into coaching, Declan Kidney rang me and he said, it's, it's, it's all about the players you have in your coach. And I think we were, we were blessed with the team we had for Bowes that year. We got promoted. Cully Tucker was the head coach. I was assistant coach. And it was yourself, Kyle Sheridan, Tommy O'Donnell, JJ Hanran, Dave Foley, uh, uh, Sean Henry. So we six or seven, you know, professionals uh, playing with us. So it was a, uh, an absolute pleasure to coach you. And I, I, I just remember Cully telling me, like, every time we get into a 22, we had a call, which was a lemon off a line out. And it was, I think it was a down and a drive. But you kept you kept changing the call as the ball was going into the line out. Cancel, cancel. <laughs> just, just get me an appeal so you can get your hands in the ball. He was, what did he call it? Greedy ball, because you were just the most greedy player in the world. And you, just <laughs> wanted, you wanted to carry every time. But I suppose that's, that's led on to you being one of the most uh, aggressive carriers of a ball in in Irish rugby um so obviously that's something you pride yourself on uh yeah look I always try and uh you know back then I suppose the greedy, greed, the greedy ball uh term uh thank god that didn't stick uh, I remember Kyle Sheridan actually you say I'd been really tripping him up uh he was playing scrum half at the time I've been really tripping him up going to the rocks going no no stay out um yeah look it's something you know if you can give momentum to the team and it, it helps the team. Like, I, I'm happy to do that. You know, I think everyone um, has strengths and weaknesses in their game. And sometimes we can focus too much on our weaknesses, which is obviously something you need to do when your work on. But uh, at the same time, you've you got to go to your strengths. And ball carrying probably has been a strength of mine over the years. And um, it's something that I, I need to keep developing. So confidence is a big thing for you and kind of exuding confidence and and uh, uh, kind of that you're, I suppose, uh, I remember a particular story about you calling up a Buccaneers player that you were going to be playing the following weekend and scrummaging against. Is this true? And uh, This again is back under 20s. That is, you can't be key. You obviously just went to one source for all these stories yesterday. <laughs> the under 20s, lads, lads. And exuding a lot of confidence on him, telling him that you were going to destroy him next weekend. Is this true? No, I can't answer that now. Uh, yeah, let you <laughs> off the hook. Let you off the hook. Thanks. Uh, but come here, when it, when you kicked into to, to playing for Monster regularly, um, what was the transition like for you coming out of academy? Was that you know I suppose into a pretty uh, pretty successful team, pretty successful front row? Was that what was the what was that very exciting for you? And uh, how challenging was it for you to make that breakthrough? It was incredibly exciting, and it was incredibly tough to break into the team. You know when I broke into that pack, you know, it was um, myself, it was first of all, you had Marcus, Vian, um, and then below that, you know, you would have had uh, Dara Hurley, Dave Ryan, who who were quite hotly tipped at the time to take over. And then you would, on the other side, you had BJ, John Hayes, you had um, like Severely, uh, Flad just retired uh, with his calf, uh, but you Paulie, Dunners, Nico, you know, um, you can keep going through all the names but that was the kind of pack you were trying to break into um, we actually so I would have done two years I didn't get into the academy till I was quite late so I played those two years of bowls under 20s and Ian Sherwin uh, might, might, he didn't want to let me into the academy at the time um, and Ian Costello fought my case he went down with clips from him um, and got me in 
So I owe Kazi a big one for that. Um, and I did two years in the academy till 22, and then I went straight into a full contract um, on the back of... We won, We had a very good B&I Cup side, um, which right. would have had... Yeah, would have had the likes of uh, Sherry Archer, Peter O'Mahony, um, you know, Dave O'Callaghan, and a lot of lads that would have gone on, Dave Foley, Nags, Murray, a lot of lads that would have gone on to play for Munster. And those sessions back then between the eighth side to be like I'll always remember Dumpo was in charge and um Axel then you need to, like the scraps that used to be a training uh between the B and I Cup side and the senior team. Um it was just incredibly um incredibly uh I suppose tough team to break into and every uh session was just uh very tough like you know you'd really earn your stripes back then to break into the team so i think that stood to a lot of the, that crop of players going forward you know likes of peter O'Mahony, likes uh, uh murray and um, sherry archer etc yeah were you on the bus that time when paulie uh took his teeth out we've told that story before when you all strapped yourselves into yes. the back of the bus yeah, that was a very much a changing of the guard moment, wasn't it? Yeah, I actually think we had that chant going, uh, get the corpse off the bus or something crazy like that. <laughs> <It's called laughs> Paul, uh, that was the change of the guard. I think we started calling Paulie the corpse. Yeah, you had a megaphone and signs and everything like you were uh, picketing, basically. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it was. I remember those times. It was It was a It was a pretty uh, special time in Munster like to have that... Um, that I don't know. Once they were just the back at the, the Magnus League win in 2011. And yeah, yeah. It was, yeah, it was, <clears> it was very exciting. It was, you know, place we need to get back to. Yeah, is that how has that kind of compared over the last seven or eight years in terms of competition for places? Is that uh, I know that's very difficult for any team to get to that level, but is uh, has it been any anywhere close to that? Um, I think rugby as a whole has probably changed. You know, like that monster pack probably didn't change for how many years, you know, maybe five, six years, that pack was the exact same one to eight, like, you know, bar the odd change here and there. Uh, now, I suppose it's maybe more games in the season and it's just become uh, ultra competitive for spots now. And, you know, you pro- we probably have a lot more uh, signings, you know, foreign signings in now. Um, so the, the, the squad does change quite a bit from week to week. Whereas, um, you know, when you're trying to break into that team back in 2011, 2012, you're literally trying to take a fella's position who's been starting there for four or five years. Whereas now, you, you know, your position is essentially up for grabs every week. Now, I know it was back then, but it just seems it, there's a lot more rotation and uh, you get a lot more chances probably now. Mm. And what was the relationship like with like yourself or Horn or someone that has been there that long and see someone like you coming up? Um, was he? Would he have been hard on you? Was it a was it a cold relationship, or would he, would he have been uh, good to you? I suppose because sometimes it can get pretty weird among specialist positions, right? Yeah, hundred percent. You know, at the uh, end of the day, everyone's playing for a livelihood. Like you know, you're playing for for uh, your position. Um, me and Max are actually cousins. Um, believe it or not, yeah, yeah. So wow, uh, makes so much yeah. sense. Yeah, we would have been. Um, <laughs> We would have been quite close. Like, you know, when I was in the academy, sub-academy, Max would have been great. Um, and then VN was in at the time as well. So for my first, uh, the 2012 season when Rob Penny took over, um, VN was that. So I, in at the la- end of the my first season, I had kind of broken on as second choice behind VN. And then Rob took over. Um, and then so VN started uh, the following season. Um, as first choice and then Marcus uh, was on the bench and then you know I, as a young lad always does you know I, I went into Rob and I was saying you know I, I was second choice last year and uh, you know I thought I'd uh, an excellent preseason and uh, to be honest I was expecting to be kind of first choice going into that season but Rob was uh, you know an incredible incredibly good for young lads you know he he worked with the, that New Zealand 20s team and um, He's a great rugby brain, you know, and he sat down with me. We went through the clips and um, Marcus actually pulled out and first game of the season with a back spasm and he rang me and he was like, uh, well, you got your wish, you're on the bench. And then 
I came on in that game and then from there on uh, I started uh, that, that was kind of my breakthrough season I, I came on in that game and I started every game then for the rest of the season pretty much that, um, I, w- I would imagine that style of coaching would have suited you Killer it would have been a nice way to get started a little bit of wide wide I remember like Donica found himself um, out in the wide channel quite a bit and like, it mightn't have suited him as much but for lads like you um, who just love a wee bit of space that probably would have been a great um, great starting point for you with Munster yeah, hundred percent, Trimby. Uh, he played. It was, you know, it was pack shape. We used to call it back then. Uh, P A C K. You know, two four two, similar. Um, but Rob, I think, was nearly a, a bit ahead of his time. You know, they were doing mm. that in Canterbury and the Crusaders, and um, I've given the odd phone call now, and uh, I actually met him over in Japan, and he's taken over to working over in Sydney. Um, so no, he was in great form, and yeah, I loved playing that system. Um, you know. We, I think we're actually kind of playing a bit more like that as the, the years have gone on, you know, Munster in Ireland now. And um, it's just, it's, it's back in rugby players to, to play the space. And it's great to see, you know, uh, Faz is a huge believer in it as well. You know, you, it's nearly not shape. You're just, you're, you, you're playing, you're playing what's on like. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. I, I remember even back then when I was still coaching, it was watching players like yourself and uh, front row players touching the ball and, and passing the ball five or six times a game and doing those out the back door passes. And um, <clears throat> we were talking about earlier on in, in watching New Zealand rugby over the weekend that playing with a lot of dry ball and uh, uh, in the conditions over there, you see a lot of it. So what do you reckon for the, for the big games in, in August, um, the whole of Irish rugby is going to be basically on show. Do you, do you reckon it's going to be the aim of the game is to play exciting rugby and, and, you know, throw the ball around and, and give us a spectacle. I think it's, yeah, it's it's playing, you know, what's on. You know, Steve Larkham has been incredible for us here at Munster. You know, we're, we probably missed a bit, uh, been at the World Cup and then at the Six Nations. Um, so as you were saying, you know, that's another opportunity COVID has, has allowed us. We've done a couple of Zoom calls with Steve and uh, he's been, you know, really clear in his messages about how we, we want to play and, I think you'll see Munster and as Leinster have been playing, um, you know, really playing an expensive game plan. Johan's really backing it, like so. It's it's great. Brilliant, can't wait. And come here, uh, you you bought a house in La Hinch, right? So I was talking to you the other day that your plan is to to get down there and get your hands dirty over the next couple of months. Uh, me and Trimby are the two most useless people in the world at DIY. We've realised. Um, how are your how are you fixed going into a project like that? Yeah, so I bought the house about <clears throat> two, two and a half years ago now. Um and it, it it's in a great location, you know, it's up kind of the the old school road, but there's a lot of work needs to be done to it. Um just needs uh remodernizing. So if the two if the two of you are looking for a bit of part time work, if this podcast goes <laughs> goes Get low rating, get low ratings after this. Uh, I love, uh, I love uh, plenty of work for you to do. But uh, yeah, that's the plan. Myself, and my dad are actually going to go direct labour and do it ourselves. Uh, right. Yeah. So you've done this before? No, never. Brilliant. But my dad, my dad has yeah. So just wing it. Mickey could be getting the call yet. <laughs> Back to old school training, like Rocky esque preseason training and just lift, lifting blocks and carrying up and down to the beach in Lynch yeah tops off love it well look if you do I'll be down there anyway so I'll drop the head in someday for a look uh, look killer we've 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 been delighted to have you on we've been waiting for this for ages so thanks a million man we really appreciate it thanks a million for having me lads really appreciate it big fan of yeah. the show legend good and man killer Best of luck with pre-season start next week and we can't wait to see you back in the field carrying ball. Thanks a million, lads. Cheers, Cheers man. Okay, no classics for you this week, ladies and gentlemen, but instead, we are joined by, as you can see, Sam the Sick Penguin Brown. Last time we spoke to him was early doors in COVID-19. It was about early April. He was our first confirmed penguin uh, with COVID-19. He had just recovered. He had a heavily pregnant missus. Uh, how heavily pregnant is she now? And how are you doing? Uh, I'm grand. Uh, a bit 
pastier and fatter and poorer since we last spoke, but <laughs> otherwise really good. Uh, my fiance Alwyn is she's sort of like Humpty Dumpty with arms and legs at this point. <laughs> and I was little one will be popping out hopefully in the next week or so. If my maths serve me right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So she technically due on the 25th, but like she's full term now, so she might just surprise appearance at any time. Who knows? Amazing. I had promised our listeners and viewers earlier on that we might have a, a live home birth during the show today. Um, but now that it, now that we're here, I'm like, please don't make that happen. <laughs> I've, uh, I've bundled her off to the midwife so that she can't roll her eyes at me while I'm recording this. Um, yeah. <laughs> that would uh, that, that would be a nice little season finale. Everything just building up to this little baby penguin was born. And then you could have a cliffhanger where you don't find out the sex and you're like, Tune in next time for season three. <laughs> I, I kind of wish we hadn't told anyone the sex because obviously it, it's a wee girl. So we just had really kindly, we just had donations of clothes from all over the world, friends, family, well-wishers. And we've got like a hay bale of baby clothes at this point that we need to kind of sort through and wash. And Like Owen keeps picking them up and showing me and going like, oh, and I, I mean, I'm really excited about being a dad and having a baby and things, but I can't, I don't have it in me to feel anything for a tiny pink baby grove. So I've been, <laughs> <laughs> been working on faking my reaction. You know, going, oh. Yeah, that that wears you down, man, over time. That doesn't <laughs> change. It gets worse, doesn't it? You're like, I don't care. It's just going to shit all over it anyway. It's no matter what it looks like. You'll be out of it in an hour. Um, so you've been... Like yeah, pop, you, we've got so many baby groves. I don't think we need nappies. I think we can just have single use baby groves and throw them out the window. <laughs> out the window. Um, so you've been baby proofing the house, I presume, and turning it from less of a, of a man pad into a baby pad. It doesn't, yes. to be fair, Sam, it doesn't look that baby proof at the minute. <laughs> <laughs> there, is, there is a skull with very sharp horns and some tribal <laughs> spears hanging <laughs> dangerously on the wall. I accept that point. I mean, you'll notice that they are safely mounted to the wall. So unless the baby is very tall and very mobile, she's not going to be pulling those off. have got little, little, little corks on the top. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, that was, I've, I basically, I've lived in the same apartment for about 11 years now. And like my, my work would usually take me overseas for about six months of the year. So I've, it's literally just sort of gone to, you know, it's got a sofa and a TV and that's pretty much all I needed. But uh, my fiance made it very, very clear to me that that was not acceptable moving forwards. So I've had like big old job on my hands since we last spoken, kind of, yeah, trying to make it less of a less of a crack den and more of a family home <laughs> <laughs> not a little crack den uh it's looking good but look last time we had you on we were talking about leon the movie and you uh you you gave us you schooled us a little bit on on how to review a movie and then we found out afterwards that you were actually a film a documentary maker um and we were like jesus christ why didn't we get into that with it or why didn't we just <laughs> ask you the ask you the question beforehand <laughs> So, um, yeah, give us, we, give us your IMBD. Have you got an IMBD? Uh, yeah, I do. I do. Um, I don't know if it's right up to date, but, um, so basically, I mean, I've been a freelance documentary maker for God, how long? About 14, 15 years now. And I mean, I'll be like brutally honest. Most of the stuff I make is sort of shite to pay the mortgage. Um, there's been... same here, same here, Sean. <laughs> <laughs> There's been a couple, like a couple of good ones down the years. Um, I've done a lot of, I've sort of fallen into like sort of adventure survival type programs a lot of times. Um, so like years ago, I did one of the first series of Bear Grylls, the island. So it was like running around in a grass skirt with a camera, uh, slaughtering animals. Um, what else? Tell us that? about that because wow. we just looked that up, and I, I watched one series of that. Was there were there a few series of that? I think I think they're still doing it. They're doing it oh, with really? um, celebrities now, um, for like a shorter period of time. We did one of the first ones before they'd done any of the health and safety. So they put it. They literally put us on an island filled with crocodiles and cliffs and like all kinds of sort of carnivorous flies and things. So yeah. it was it was class. It was forty days and like really really intense. And where very, was it? Uh, just off. It was in the Pacific coast off Panama. 
so wow. proper like tropical island um it was really cool like it was um and you know it was a little bit like locked down you know you just it was the, the same people every day for 40 days and everyone's just sort of steadily coming apart at the seams and going a bit doolally was that the um, one sam was that the one where you killed uh the the caiman by any chance it wasn't actually a caiman. It turns out <laughs> it was a critically endangered American crocodile, uh, which is actually, it's on the same protected list as the snow leopard. Um, so Channel 4 ended up having to spend uh, quite a lot of, <laughs> I think there were quite a lot of donations to endangered animal charities after that. Shit. So, oh, uh, because it did, it because it, you were, everybody was very hungry at that stage. I don't know how long you'd gone without eating. And then it went from that to like this barbecue came in this absolute feast. And then there was the inevitable kind of tension between one or two guys who were like, oh, it's, it's a beautiful, you know, creature. We can't, we can't eat this. And then everybody else was like, it would eat us. I'm more starving. <laughs> <laughs> it's like my cat. I keep saying this about the cat, lads. If the cat, if I <laughs> died, the cat would eat me. <laughs> it's fine. It, yeah. Cat, cats wait like three hours or something. Um, dogs will like sort of loyally sit by your feet and just sort of howl until you're carried yeah. away yeah um so so that, that was that was a big old that was that was the last big old sort of adventure um what else have i done uh there was a, a big another survival one we did for channel four was sailing it was i think it was recreating mutiny and the bounty so it was basically taking a 21 foot rowboat and sailing it four thousand miles across the south pacific from tonga through the Great Barrier Reef to Indonesia, um, which took 60 days. So that was a big old, big old schlep. Um, wow. Yeah, where, where again, we ran out of water and all went buck daft, um, <clears throat> which was not, not in any way pleasant to have done, but it's quite, it's a nice one to boast about at dinner parties. Yeah, like by the end of that, you, you're you like, what's the last 20 days like and something like that? Um, so it's, it's, it was sort of a uh, paranoia, kidney damage. And uh, so I was about 10 stone, 10 stone by the time we finished, having gone from like 12 and a half, 13 um, wow. and just bonkers. Um, yeah, that was, that was a, that was a tricky one. Uh, hey Sam, you're more, um, you're more hardened and kind of cut out for that sort of stuff than, than I, than I was like, I, even the World Cup in 2011, but I, I was I was dying to get home. I was glad we got beat by wheels. Otherwise, we would have had to play two more rounds. <laughs> you're you're paranoid and, and and losing weight and everything as well. Yeah. <laughs> scurvy yeah, and then should be at scurvy by the quarterfinals. <laughs> <laughs> Then the last, the last thing I did before my industry got sort of exploded by COVID was um, it was a documentary about the first African American guy to get a full face transplant. Oh yeah. And, um, so I was out, out and I was talking to Tremble actually during that. Um, yeah, just this guy who he was in a terrible car crash and had his whole face burnt off, and they've uh, yeah pioneering surgery. He's now got like you wouldn't know, like he's really you wouldn't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like I mean, he looks a bit. A bit odd, like like slightly slightly scrambled in the face department, <clears throat> but like like you'd never guess it was a face transplant, and you'd never guess you know he'd be late sixties and he looks about looks about my age now. Really? So he got so, someone else donated their face that had died, a younger person. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't think they had much say in the matter. They were just on the <laughs> list. Um, they didn't opt out. <laughs> how much? How much does it cost to to do to get something like that? Um, well, so the, it turns out that the U.S. military have, because I think they they have a vested interest in trying to put people's faces back on, because they they'd probably per per capita the military would probably lose more faces than the general public. So it was all funded by the uh, by the U.S. Army, but to, to I would imagine I would imagine it's very difficult to to source that sort of data. Like who who loses the most faces right here? <laughs> I thought, I thought this was a conspiracy here, like where it was like face off, where they were going to try and like yeah. steal the faces off people and put them on other people and then, you know, try and hang them up for, for doing something. Did uh, you watch that for, for research? I don't, think <laughs> so. I don't think the technology is quite there yet. <laughs> John Travolta didn't look that scrambled. 
uh, what a movie yeah um should have reviewed that actually yeah so uh geez I'm, i must look that up i'm mad to see what he looked like um just having as an option just you know if it ever yeah i wouldn't I, I wouldn't i wouldn't go down that road unless absolutely necessary he's a guy called called robert chelsea you can you can google it and you see the before and after really amazing mm. like really inspiring guy like one of the least sort of like very like very religious guy and just very at peace with the world you know like he was most people who suffer that kind of injury would have like massive depression you know there's a lot of suicides and that kind of thing but he just had this like sort of incredible faith where he you know just you know he's like this is this is this is the path god's chosen for me i'm going to make myself a better man kind of thing um oh. so yeah no that, that was that was very genuinely um genuinely humbling to like to meet someone like that yeah i'm sure yeah, Sam, that's, Sam, that's Sam, to work on what um so you said there uh, like obviously the last few months then the industry just gets locked down what what way is that looking because they're talking talking about very selfishly they're talking about cin- cinemas opening um pretty soon maybe they are in london already i'm not sure but um but will there will there be good movies like for the next year obviously like everything's been stalled and what what way is that going to look in the industry um i i mean sort of i selfishly i sort of look at my bit the most because you know i've got to pay the mortgage and things and m- mine mine will probably be, be one of the last bits of the industry to recover i reckon because most of my work's overseas mm. so it's like visas and quarantines and all that palaver um is it's like it's dependent on the the virus going away mm. sufficiently for people to be able to ensure productions kind of thing I think we're gonna. There's gonna be a bit of movie-wise. I think there'll be a lot of stuff being cancelled or sort of mothballed. So I think there is gonna be a bit of a dearth of stuff for a while, um, unfortunately. So yeah, yeah. That's it's time to have a baby, though, I suppose. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like I said, like last time we spoke, I said I was gonna try and finish Netflix, and I think I did. I think just the sort of the uh, TV binging sort of lost its lost its uh lost its edge yeah well the one thing that i haven't finished is documentaries i haven't really jumped into them over the last couple of months it's been basically movies and tv shows so if you were to because we've usually used this part as a as a, a way to recommend stuff or review stuff would you give us your top three or even your top documentaries um that you've ever seen shit i had since yesterday to think about this um, <laughs> and you didn't give us one anything anything you got um, let me think uh, there's a there's a really good uh, is it Ken Burns uh, Netflix series on the Vietnam War which is like a right. good old good old binge like it'll be about eight hours long um, the OJ one from a couple of years ago if you haven't already the big three yeah, five, nine hours absolutely just I I am um, uh, me and my flatmate sat down to watch the first one a couple of years ago and then like, we got to the end of three and a half hours and we're like should we just watch one just we'll watch the first hour of the second one and then sure enough we watched the whole three back to back so I had to go straight from my sofa to work <laughs> I just like oh dear <laughs> they're like you, you look Whoa. terrible we are drinking like no <laughs> I, just, I just watched the three one back to back oh, OJ's at it again yeah uh, um, other than that I mean I'm I'd be, I, I mean, like, shamefully, when I, you know, like it's sort of because it's my industry, I don't really watch as much as I should. You know, it's a bit of a busman's holiday. So, like, I'd probably watch more like stupid rugby clips on YouTube than I would documentaries. Yeah. Um, me too. Well, I think we, why don't we do a, a rugby documentary? If we're, if we're all stuck on our um, respective islands, why don't they come home and we'll put, uh, put our minds together, collaborate, and do a rugby um, documentary. You know, I, I've, been, I've been thinking about that, actually. Like, I'd absolutely love to. Like, I don't think, like, there's been, like, there's there's the 97 Lions one that everyone always talks about, which mm-hmm. I watched, watched again a couple of years ago. Um, like, the like the Lions in 97 would have probably been what really got me into rugby in the first place. Mm-hmm. Um, and when you watch it again, it's not that good. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> <laughs> Is it not? It was no. just the first of its time, right? Yeah. 
like yeah. it, you know, it's like I just I, one of the sort of lasting images for me was kind of Keith Wood in a dress with a wig and Martin Johnson in a dress and a wig. It's sort of and loads of people going ho 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 banter. Uh, <laughs> 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 um, but like, yeah. no, I still remember it. Like my mom wouldn't let, let us get Sky Sports when I was a kid. So I listened to it on like a really crackly radio, you know, like and wow. I was kind of writing down the score and stuff. Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, Teletext. I think- Teletext would have been back then. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, the, that was the, the 1999 World Cup. I watched quite a lot of it on Teletext because again, my mom wouldn't let me get the channel. Jesus. Sounds like probably nineteen twenty stuff. My <laughs> yeah. memory, my memory of that Lions tour was, or that that documentary. Who was it said uh, one case of a mistaken identity? Do you remember this? They were doing like media training, and uh, they're like, "You were spotted outside a nightclub the night before a game," and then there's a Scottish player. Well, it wasn't Dottie Weir, was it? One case of mistaken identity. The cro- everybody erupts, and then like that's the <laughs> one liner. Yeah, I can't bit- remember. Yeah, that's that's all I remember. That's all I remember. I don't remember the the banter of the men dressed as women. Mm. <laughs> Hilarious. <laughs> yeah, do it again, do it again, fellas. <laughs> well, I think um, we're we're definitely going to go to South Africa whenever the Lions might kick off, whether if it's next June or next September. They're talking about. Um, so look, let's put it in the in the pipeline. Let's do it. Let's we'll uh, uh-huh. and 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 get out and make it more about. Us having the crack and the safari, supposed to dressing up like women. Yeah, let's, let's not. We're not. Gonna, which is fine. Which is totally <laughs> fine. <laughs> uh, we're not going to go anywhere anywhere near any rugby. It's the documentary is going to be called "Living Without the Lions." Yeah. yeah. So, so Perfect. tune in. Tune in next time. Yeah. Sam. Um. Uh, so we were we're, we're kind of keen to get you on but we're kind of in apology mode really just because we were getting on like we're movie critics right <laughs> and we got you on and we just talked about uh your sickness <laughs> really <laughs> <laughs> yeah which was obviously very current at the time but um uh, would you give us a quick review of our reviews because we're inclined to think that we haven't a clue what we're talking about but we hope we're aware of that and we hope we're not taken too seriously are we are we getting the right sort of vibe or um capturing anything correct with these movie reviews well look at the end of the day like movies are they're there to be like consumed and enjoyed right um you know they're not made for you know snooty film critics to you know make like highfalutin comparisons to philosophy and things you know and i like i i, I mean i've i've loved Devin you've done because we seem to like we're about the same age so we have the same kind of mm. like double shot of nostalgia and then just sort of uh random observations so i think you nailed braveheart for example um i thought that was class yeah yeah no no i'm i am uh I've absolutely i don't want to sort of i don't act like uh you know superior in any way in that respect you know because I, lo- I love movies not from a you know like you get i can be boring to watch movies from sometimes because i'll notice like if the continuity is wrong or something mm. Generally, that's only if it's not a good movie, you know, like a good movie, whatever it's about will sweep you up and you'll just be like, you know, you, it's just escapism and you just enjoy it, you know? Yeah. So the last uh, movie, the last movie that I felt that, and as you say, it just sweeps you up. There's something you can't describe with it, uh, was 1917. Um, I went to, to see that at the cinema with a mate of mine and literally... 30 seconds into it, we turned to each other and we're like, this is class. I'm totally <laughs> captivated in this. And like nothing's yeah. happened. And I don't know, I don't know what it is. There's just something indescribable about it. Uh just whenever something really grabs you. Um, yeah. Mm. yeah. But that's the that's last Christopher, time that's happened. That's that's Christopher Nolan again, right? Yeah. Yeah. He's our hero, so he can do no wrong. Yeah. You a big fan of his? Yeah, absolutely. I think he's, there'd be, there's a few sort of commercial directors who haven't, I don't think have made a dud. So like, like Danny Boyle, like all of his movies mm. are like, so they're really different. Like a Christopher Nolan movie, he actually loads of his are really different as well. <clears throat> you know, most, but there's, I read somewhere that like, uh, you know, a really good, like a top director will make three good movies. A great director will make five, you know, like you're lucky if you make one. Um, I think Christopher Nolan would be pushing towards five easily, like a couple of mm. Batman's Memento. Um, I really like the Prestige, you know, the one about the two, mm. Mm. which yeah. like I, I was trying, I was doing that hard sell to my fiance 
because like there's obviously a bit of a battle for the remote control in in my apartment at the minute and uh, so i have to really make the case for things and if i lose we end up watching the oc so um <laughs> i tried to, <laughs> I, tried, I tried to sell a customer to her and i was like it's about these two wizards and she's like <laughs> brilliant yeah that's that's one i haven't watched in a while um did you does your missus allow you to get sky sports no yes, did you yeah. uh, so you watched yeah. rugby the weekend uh, no, I didn't. It wasn't really. I mean, it's yeah. I like. I'm. I mean, I'm gagging for rugby to be back. But equally, I've never been a huge Super Rugby fan. Like for me, rugby is like Ulster, Munster, Leinster. It's Ireland. You know, it's 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 tests. You know, like the internationals mm. are what I miss more than anything. And then obviously, you haven't been like grown up in the stands at Ravenhill or Ravenspan or whatever it's called now. Um, <laughs> You know, I it's it's you know it's the sort of it's like the tribal parochial bit of it that really gets me. Um, so yeah, I know that, and also I'm I'm sort of squeezing in as much sleep as I possibly can at the minute. So getting up early, getting up at five a.m. for Super Rugby is not really mm. not gonna happen. Yeah, Unfortunately, think, you can't might... stockpile sleep, man. So it's, just, <laughs> it's not going to work. Uh, the New Zealand, the the tournament at the minute in New Zealand, though, it's I think it's I'm the same as you, Sam. I find it hard to get into Super Rugby because they change the parameters, the the competition, the pool setup, everything every year, and then they bring in more teams. And I'm like, well, I don't, I have no affiliation with that, or no kind of history or nostalgia, or kind of I don't understand, you know, the background. And then whenever they just go five. Um, uh, it, it's as close probably to like the New Zealand version of, of Interpros as possible and there's a way mm. because it's kind of it's ring fenced obviously just the five teams I think I can get into that I think I can uh, get a bit of a knowledge of a bit of understanding of the background of each team and the rivalries and the kind of the subplots mm. going on I think I can get into that so I hope they don't I hope they just keep it at that and then that means it's more accessible yeah. then I'm yeah. the same. I think it's uh, it's it's the way forward. Like maybe bringing the Australian teams that might because there is an existing massive rivalry between Australia and New Zealand. But you do get you know the best players in New Zealand playing against each other every week, and you could see it that the crowd are way more buying into that than yeah. than bringing down maybe South African teams, Argentinian teams, Japanese teams, um, and then they're being on at different times of the day or night where you don't get to see them. So um, I think we can. A lot of the Super Rugby I'd watched, you know, like Australia and South Africa and things, they're like they're franchises rather than teams with any kind of history. Mm. And there's something, mm. and I guess we'll have to get used to this. See when you're watching a, a match with like an empty stadium or just with a few like, you know, just pockets of fans here and there. There's It's so different. Like it just feels so empty and deflated compared to, you know, when you've got like 70,000 hostile fans like baying, you know, like the, the atmosphere yeah. is so much of it, I think. Yeah, I think that's the competition that they've gotten wrong. So yeah, hopefully they get it right. But um, I look like the Irish rugby is going to be back in August. So even though it's going to be behind closed doors, what you make of that? With the uh, what? I don't know if they're going to put in crowd noise or whatever. Um, I'm not sure that would work for rugby. Although it's been working in NRL. I I mean. I can't imagine piped in crowd noise being anything other than weird. Like playing sort of. Feed yeah. for football on the PlayStation or whatever, but like, I mean, I'm just glad it's back because I mean, it's uh, you know, I didn't realize how much like uh, how much of my brain was consumed by thinking about <laughs> live rugby, like this sort of this whole last three four months or whatever. It's really like it's forced me to read books and kind of you know pursue new things. It's been it's been been awful. Like so, I, I can't <laughs> wait to, back to the <laughs> I can't, can't get wait to get back to the old ways. Yeah. Me too. Me too. Well, look, what a week, man. We're, uh, we're we might we might get you on, I suppose, next week or two uh, when when the little baby arrives. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. Give us a little look at our young. This will be our youngest penguin. <laughs> to the yeah. herd. What's a what's a group of penguins called? I should know this. Uh, I can't remember. A lot of them. A lot <laughs> of penguins. <laughs> uh so look yeah best of luck to the two of you over the next week it's uh very exciting times we're delighted for you and uh yeah enjoy it oh thanks guys really nice one sam thanks a million for coming on sam appreciate it buddy
Okay, Trimby, we probably could have wrapped up with Sam there, but uh, we'll do it now anyway. Uh, sorry about that, Sam. I could, I could have left him on to the end, although we would have felt pressured maybe to give him Penguin of the Week or maybe his his uh, his unborn child. But we instead will 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 give it someone who really deserves it. This week, so yeah, I'd say Sam's child, unborn child, is probably a shoe in for Penguin of the Week next week. I the was only, thinking that yeah. the only way um, the the child won't get it is if. She doesn't um, have birth before two episodes time. So that's, and then just yeah. logistically, they might get it for the first episode of next season. We'll see what happens. The, bur- the ball's in her court. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, it's hers okay. to lose. <laughs> hmm. um, uh, so a couple of, a uh, little bit of um, chat in the Facebook group this week. The penguins are in fine fettle. Um, there was a, a picture of a mannequin with a dildo on it, um, which was, you know, refreshing lovely um daniel gill um someone said who is this player daniel gill says that's paul middle name dild o'connell which i thought was very clever very good very Uh, Very daniel you're in the mix um you're an honorable mention uh bernard uh, mcgreer was disgusted with um some of the twitter um threats that jacob was getting um but he (laughs) misspelled it and he he talked about death treats, <laughs> something, <laughs> something very different. Uh, accidentally, you've made you put yourself in the running there, Bernard. But uh, Kate McGrath, um, off the back of the putting challenge, was able to find the link for that. What was the back? What was the backstory to that, um, Barry? She found the link to the actual game that Bart's that Marge Simpson buys Bart um, in the Simpsons episode where Bart. Uh, steals um, a computer game from the from, that he wants. I can't remember the computer game that he wanted to have, but he tried to steal it. Um, but what the fuck is the name of this? Sorry, my language. Um, it is the Lee Carvalho's Potting Challenge, which Homer, oh Jesus Christ, which Marge buys him at the end. And he fakes interest and feigns interest to win her love over by playing this computer game. So the Penguin of the Week, what's her name again? Kate McGrath has done more research finding that link than we've ever done. So well done, Kate. Unbelievable. Yeah, she found the actual game. So now we have a link to it here and we can go play the game. And I presume it'll be as Bart, as bad as Bart let it out to be where he just <laughs> launches a ball off the off the tee into the car park, I think. <laughs> or no, he's on, the, he's on the putting green and they're like, would you like to select putter? You have selected driving whatever club <laughs> driver <laughs> driving club <laughs> driving club <laughs> as bad as golf as uh as as who else was bad at golf <laughs> i don't know i think who do we have who do we have on recently that was shit at golf um it wasn't hook was it was it Jacob? hook Oh, we just list all our high profile. Oh, Ty Bur- Burn. It was Ty Burn. He was shit at golf. Remember? Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, all right. So get on that. I'll, we'll put it up on our Facebook page, or is it up there already? And we can, you can play it. It's, it's absolutely shite, I'm sure. Right. Thank you very much. That's your penguin of the week. Thank you, everybody, for listening. Thank you for watching. Thank you to David Coin. Thank you to Sam the Sick Penguin Brown. Thank you to Pat, Paul, Dermot, and Anthony for putting the show together. This has been Baz and Andrews, House of Rugby here on Joe, together with Guinness Party on Trimby. Party on.